now is to make sense of uh, both philosophy of physics by using uh, Kant's, Kant's uh, philosophy as, uh, as a way of understanding it. So, in order to do that, I will start by uh, analyzing the way Bohr was apparently conservative uh, towards uh, uh, classical physics, namely that he was uh, um, keen on keeping some classical concepts even in quantum physics. Uh, the, the second step will be to list more systematically the main features of Kant's philosophy of science in general and even of knowledge and uh, put it in a one-one correspondence with some features of both philosophy of quantum physics. And then uh, the first step will be to show that uh, even though complementarity is a very new concept and it's very unkantian in its uh, spirit, it can be seen as a stretching of some elements of, of uh, Kant's philosophy of knowledge. And finally, I will broaden again the whole uh, perspective and try to compare two types of uh, theories of knowledge. A theory of knowledge which is called transcendental, I will explain this to you because I know you are not philosophers here. And on the other hand, another type of uh, theory of knowledge which is naturalized and show that Bohr's theory of knowledge was definitely transcendental as opposed to naturalized. And uh, of course I've uh, put a very strange little um, uh, picture of uh, you know, a Möbius ribbon, because uh, the roadmap I've uh, drawn here is a little bit circular, it comes back to itself. Now, what about the relations between Bohr and philosophy? You have heard this morning uh, Professor Heilbronn uh, speaking of that, speaking of his training in philosophy. But in order to uh, get to the topic, I will first uh, come back to the way Bohr is usually read and received. People usually think that, um, in fact, the so-called orthodox or Copenhagen interpretation is an interpretation that was directly borrowed from Bohr. But things are not so simple, in fact. And usually people are a little bit uh, careful about not borrowing too much to Bohr and rather borrowed uh, things, elements of thought, to uh, Heisenberg, to Pauli, to Dirac, to von Neumann, and so on and so on. And they get a little bit of Bohr, not too much. Why? Because usually they, they, they say, and for instance, uh, Enrico Fermi has said in a famous book, that uh, Bohr was too philosophical for them. They need usually something more you know, practical. They need some orientations. They need a guide to research. And uh, Bohr uh, gives them rather uh, elements of doubt of, about their own uh, ways of uh, researching. So it, it was a little bit dif difficult for them to integrate a lot of Bohr's ideas into their own way of uh, thinking physics. Now, the second point, the, the second reason why they didn't like too much to integrate a lot of Bohr in their uh, thinking about quantum physics was that, um, in fact, nobody really knows what is Bohr's philosophy. Nobody knows how to characterize it in the usual classification of philosophies. Sometimes people say that he was a pragmatist, sometimes that he was an operationalist, sometimes a positivist, sometimes an idealist, and so on and so on. And he, he was not really any one of these things, and probably he was something else. And I think that the something else he was, he, he was, was probably much closer to Kant. And yet, things are not so obvious here again, because when Bohr was trained, when he was at the university, he had indeed some um, lectures in philosophy. He followed some lectures of philosophy, and as Professor Helbron has said, he followed the lectures of, um, of Harald Öfding. And, but when you see what, what lectures he was following, he followed lectures about Kierkegaard and about 
formal and, uh, and general logic. And uh, whereas uh, Höfding was also giving lectures about uh, more general it items uh, on philosophy of knowledge, he was giving lectures on post-Kantianism and so on and so on, but Bohr didn't seem to have followed these, at, at least according to Jan Fay, uh, the, who wrote a book about the connections between the, philosopher, uh, the Danish philosopher Harald Höfding and Niels Bohr. Okay, There's another point that makes it difficult to understand why I am comparing uh, Bohr's philosophy of physics and Kant's theory of knowledge is that usually people think that uh, uh, modern physics uh, meant the end of Kant's philosophy of knowledge. It was a terrible challenge, at least, to, uh, the, to Kant's philosophy of knowledge. Uh, and for instance, you have a remark by Albert Einstein in 1924 that he said that in, in view of general relativity, one cannot stick any longer to Kant's system of a priori concepts and norms. The same for Heisenberg. He said that in view of quantum mechanics, the a priori concepts which Kant considered as undisputable truths are no longer contained in the scientific system of modern physics. So it's very clear that every single item of Kant's philosophy of knowledge seems to have been challenged by modern physics. The so-called a priori forms of sensibility, which are space and time, as shaped by, uh, by um, you know, Euclid's geometry, were challenged by general relativity, which used uh, Riemann's Rima, Rima, geometry. And the so-called a priori concepts uh, or categories that were used and posited by Kant, namely the category, category of substance, the category of causality, and the category of reciprocity, were challenged by quantum mechanics. For instance, uh, Heisenberg challenged the category of causality. Uh, Schrodinger challenged the category of substance as a little chunk of matter that is permanent in space and time. So everything was challenged, apparently, by modern physics. What is left, finally, of Kant's philosophy after the onrise of modern physics? Okay, so we have here a, little, a strong doubt. And yet, in the 30s, you find two important philosophers, uh, Ernst Cassirer and Grete Hermann, who were both neo-Kantian thinkers, who said that modern physics were, was the most extraordinary vindication of Kant's philosophy. So clearly there was a tension here. You have physicists who say this is not the case, and you have philosophers who are happy to say, oh yes, finally you vindicated Kant's philosophy. So now let's try to, to, to understand this. Okay, in order to understand this, I want to probe into one point of Bohr's philosophy of physics, which is uh, his apparently, I say, apparently conservative attitude towards classical physics, his need to keep on with uh, classical concepts. Uh, you know that in 1913, in the famous um, articles about the, the Bohr's um, atom model, uh, um, Bohr posited several assumptions that were not very, um, very coherent with one another. And afterwards, a few years later, few, very few years later, Bohr said that uh, these were horrid assumptions. Okay, so what kind of assumptions did he make? He made assumptions such that, um, you know, some, some parts of his model of atom was ruled by classical physics, some parts we, we were um, um, ruled by the so-called quantum rules that were borrowed and adapted from Planck and Einstein. And, um, you know, 
and there were also strange uh, connections because on the one hand he was positing the idea of a continuous trajectory of the electron around the nucleus and the, on the other hand he was positing the sudden and undescribable uh, transition of uh, the electron from one, anob uh, one orbit to another. So, um, okay, w where these assumptions incoherent? No, I don't think so, and usually people didn't think so, because in some way there were precise rules to use at a certain point classical mechanics and at other points the quantum rules, and even at some points when they were absolutely needed, the, the rules of classical electrodynamics by way of the famous correspondence principle. So it was not the problem of incoherence, but the problem of a lack of unity. The, f the problem that, uh, you, you know, the model of the atom, uh, what, which was formulated by Bohr, was like a patchwork. It was bits and pieces. So it was so uh, patchy that people thought that it could only be a provisional state of physics and at a, that at a certain later stage uh, this patchwork will be entirely replaced by a purely quantum uh, theory. Yet, the strange thing is that Bohr didn't do that, immediately at least, because, uh, you know, from 1913 to 1925, he progressively adapted his initial compromise, trying to find the right place for the intervening of the new quantum concepts and the old classical concepts. So classical physics was still there. For instance, he formulated the fam famous correspondence principle that allowed him to find the uh, amplitude of the lines, the spectral lines, whereas there, were, there was nothing in his own model to, to find the amplitude of the spectral line. On the other hand, he was um, uh, trying to understand the kind of relations that w was still in, uh, in, uh, in progress between classical physics and quantum physics. On the one hand, there was some kind of continuity because you needed at least to posit that at the limit of large quantum numbers, uh, the, the quantum laws of uh, um, radiation were tending towards the classical laws of radiation. So there was a, co a con connection by continuity in that case. But on the other hand, there was a huge gap because uh, even though the results were converging at the limit of large uh, quantum numbers, um, the concepts were quite di dissimilar. There was only a quantitative convergence, but no conceptual convergence between the two uh, lines of thinking. So Bohr tried many kinds of compromises in order to see where was the true line of division between classical and the new uh, quantum concepts. And uh, he, he uh, formulated what is now, now known as a bad compromise, which is the theory of quantum radiation of Bohr, Kramers and Slater in 1924. According to this uh, uh, theory of radiation, the electron was still thought of as going around the nucleus on an orbit, just as in the initial Bohr model. But the radiation was no longer represented by a real field, but by a virtual field, which interacted with the electrons only on a stochastic way. And therefore, there was, when you had this virtual field on an electron, you had only a certain probability of transition at the emission and a certain probability of transition at the reception of the virtual field. So there was, in that case, no conservation of energy and momentum and there was uh, only, at least at the individual uh, level, but these uh, principles of conservation were only uh, valid at the statistical level.
But it was soon seen that even this type of compromise between um, you know, the validity of classical principles of conservation at a statistical level and non-validity at the individual level um, was not um, giving the right results. So this was also abandoned. Finally, you know, in about 1924, uh, several scientists tried to completely replace the picture of uh, an electron going through uh, an orbit around the nucleus by purely quantum rules. And they called that quantum mechanics because they were replacing the old classical mechanics by, quantum, uh, by a quantum theoretical scheme. So there was the famous uh, paper by Max Born, who used for the first time the uh, name quantum mechanic in, uh, in um, German, quantum mechanics. And there was the celebrated paper of Heisenberg in 1925, who formulated the matrix mechanics. Um, so the idea of Heisenberg that is that you could still apply the Hamilton's equations, and, but only on, on uh, matrices, which, matrices which uh, were non-commutative uh, types of symbols as opposed to the ordinary commutative numbers. But even though uh, at that stage you, know, you had complete replacement of even the mechanical uh, laws by new laws of quantum uh, physics, um, Heisenberg and Bohr estimated that this uh, type of theory was still an application of the old correspondence principle between classical physics and quantum physics. Here is what Bohr said. Um, the laws of Heisenberg are a precise formulation of the tendencies embodied in the correspondence principle. And Heisenberg said exactly the same. My theory, he said, is a quantitative formulation of the correspondence principle. That means that classical physics was still there. At least it was still there, as you see, uh, in the form of uh, the Hamilton's equation. Yeah, can I just interrupt that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really think that's a misunderstanding because I think that, that what they meant there is that the, it had become the formulation of the corresponding principle had grown into this formulation of amplitudes for going from one state to the other. And this was a natural development of that. It was yeah. not to say that it was a correspondence principle. Yeah. In the sense of going to the classical. Physics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true, but you know, the, the you know the the classical physics was still there at any rate. It was still there in the form of the equation, and you will see you you know quite well actually that classical physics was never abandoned in that in get that case. Okay, so. Uh, why, where, where, where the, why there was such a persistence of maybe forms of classical physics and classical concepts? You know, you have to explain that. The first possibility is that objects are intrinsically mixed. They have classical features in them and they have quantum features in them. But Bohr's style was not to say that. He said, uh, that, that uh, in fact, the true reason was not ontological. It had nothing to do with the nature of things. It has to do something with the power of knowledge. Uh, classicity, according to him, was not something that was to be found in micro-objects. It was a condition of possibility for knowing them. And uh, here is a quote from uh, Niels Bohr. Uh, it continues to be the application of these concepts, where he meant the classical concepts, uh, alone that makes it possible to relate the symbolism of the quantum theory to the data of experience. So classical concepts were still needed in order to make this connection between the symbolism of quantum physics and the data of experience which were found in the laboratory with macroscopic tools and so on and so on. So, but in, we have to understand in that case that it's not true that, um, that um, uh, Bohr felt or believed that 
class that apparatuses in the laboratory were intrinsically uh, classical and that he believed in their reality uh, in, in the, uh, on the model of classical physics. He didn't draw uh, an ontological divide between the quantum and the classical domain, but rather only an epistemological divide between the objects of the quantum theory and, and the logical linguistic tools that are used at the laboratory in order to formulate the value of a, a measurement, the result of a measurement. So the divide was not an ontological divide, but it was rather an epistemological divide. So um, this is something that was uh, well understood, of course, by Lando and Lifshitz, who are probably the physicists, who, who, the modern physicists, who gave the most Borean uh, type of interpretation of uh, quantum physics. According to Lando and Lifshitz, quantum mechanics holds a special position among, among physical theories. It contains classical mechanics as a limiting case that we have seen, and it needs it as a foundation because we have to presuppose that, that uh, instruments can be described in the classical way. Now, the only thing is, that is needed in that case is to show that there is a self-consistency of this loop between the, um, you know, the use of classical concepts as a limiting case and the use of the classical concepts as, uh, as a presupposition. And this uh, proof of self-consistence, I think, has been given under the form of decoherence. Decoherence is, can be read this way. Now, let me come to uh, describing some features of Kant's theory of knowledge and uh, compare that to Bohr's Kant-like epistemology. Uh, the, I think the main point that has to be understood in Kant's uh, philosophy of knowledge is what he called the Copernican Revolution. Okay, now what, what is the revolution of Copernicus? Because if you want to uh, understand uh, the Kantian Copernicus revolution, we first have to understand what Copernicus himself did. Now, if we analyze the revolution of Copernicus, I think that there are two meanings of this revolution. The first meaning of this revolution is that Copernicus dissented man from his or her initially central position in the universe. You know, initially uh, there was uh, an anthropocentric model of the universe in which the Earth was central and all the other planets were going uh, around. But there is a second uh, meaning of Copernican revolution. It is that we cannot say, for instance, that an apparent trajectory of a planet on the starry uh, heavens or on the celestial vault, rather, uh, you know, has to be explained by the intrinsic properties and the intrinsic trajectories of this planet. In fact, this apparent trajectory of the planet on the celestial vault has to be explained by the relation between us on our planet Earth and the, um, the planet that we are observing. Therefore, the second type of meaning of, of Copernican revolution is relativity of attributes with respect to the knower, who is a, a certain human being on the earth. And it's exactly the second as acceptation of the Copernican revolution that was retained by Kant in his philosophy of knowledge. And here is the celebrated formulation of Kant's uh, Copernican revolution, namely going back to human being as the, the source of a certain relation between this human being and what is to be known. So Kant said this, or wrote rather, in his famous uh, preface to the second edition of the Critique of the Pure Reason. 
He said, thus far, it has been assumed that all our cognition must conform to objects. Let us try to find out by experiment whether we shall not make better progress if we assume that objects must conform to our cognition. So, revert everything. Not try to, to, to conform cognition to objects, but show what objects owe to the form of cognition. Now, uh, that means that the form of objects is predetermined by a set of preconditions, of cognitive preconditions. But this doesn't mean, of course, uh, that, that uh, cognition creates objects. Th this would be completely wrong. This just means that, that objects is not something completely beyond experience, but it's just a mode of ordering experience in such a way that a certain a bunch of experience becomes common to all of us at every moment and at every place, so that we can build an intersubjectively valid knowledge that, that can be uh, used by everybody in every lab, in every place. So this, this is Kant's idea. Objectivity not as just you know copy of something out there, but objectivity as an effort to reach intersubjective agreement. Now, uh, Bohr did something very similar actually, because of course, first of all, we have to remember the, the epistemological rather than ontological status of classical concepts according to him. Secondly, we have to understand his, uh, you know, his position during the uh, scientific revolution he was, um, he was promoting, namely the creation of quantum theory. In any scientific revolution, in, and, is, and especially, especially in this quantum revolution, Old ontologies are questioned. The old ontologies of uh, little bodies, of uh, fields, of waves, of ether, of everything are questioned. There is a sort of tabula rasa. Everything is uh, thought again. People think, uh, should I maintain this idea of a little body going around a nucleus or, or should I just skip this concept and so on and so on. And therefore, the only firm ground which is found is experience. It is results of experiments in the lab, and even closer to us, uh, you know, lived experience. This is the only thing that it cannot be doubted in some way. And this is uh, exactly, in fact, what uh, Bohr implicitly understood. And he explained that the aim the task of science is both to extend the range of our experience and to reduce it to order. He didn't say that we have to uh, probe into the intimate nature of uh, uh, objects and so on and so on. He ex insisted that we have to order experience. So here again, exactly as in Kant, go back to experience and try to understand the conditions of possibility of the experience. He gave uh, also a reflective analysis of cognition, which has to some similarities to, to Kant. When he said, for instance, that the boundary of our concepts is exactly congruent with the boundaries of ob our possibilities of, um, obser obser of observation. Why? Because, you know, uh, usually, um, you know, some, some uh, scientists not very many, but uh, in, 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 in classical time, some sci scientists believed that their concepts could go much beyond observation and that they could reconstruct things as they are in themselves independently of the fact that we observe them or not. But this was not the case of Kant's uh, and not the case of Bohr's philosophy either. Also, uh, Bohr insisted that all knowledge presents itself within a certain conceptual framework, which is quite similar to the idea of Kant, according to which all knowledge is preconditioned by certain forms of thought. 
And uh, according to Bohr here again, we, in spite of their limitation, we can by no means dispense with those forms of perception which color our whole language and in terms of which all experience must ultimately be experienced. Here again, as in Kant, you have a certain framework of thought and this framework of thought is absolutely needed to go further and build a certain region of knowledge. Okay, but there is a difference with, uh, with Kant. So the spirit is quite similar, this uh, sort of Copernican revolution, this attention to cognition, this attention to experience, this attention to the conceptual framework of knowledge. Yet there is a, an important difference. The difference is that according to uh, Kant, concepts must apply to special temporal data as uh, they are uh, formatted, so to speak, by perception. But according to Bohr, this is no longer possible because um, concepts should, in, in the new situation of quantum physics, concepts no longer apply to spatial temporal pictures. This is the famous criticism of pictures that, that is so celebrated in, in Bohr's philosophy. Um, so, in order to predict phenomena, according to Bohr, we should not use special temporal representations, but we should use what he called the purely symbolic scheme, that was the, the scheme of prediction of quantum physics, permitting predictions as to results obtainable under conditions specified by means of classical concepts. Namely, you have a symbolic scheme, and say, for instance, the Hilbert space uh, formalism, and, well, just, uh, just to, to give an example, and you give predictions about uh, data that are obtained in a certain laboratory and that are expressible by means of classical concepts. Now, is this a serious divergence between Bohr and Kant? Is it, for instance, you know, the idea, the very idea that you can modify, you know, as, as Bohr said, uh, that you, you must always pre be prepared to expect alterations in the point of views best suited for the ordering of experiments. This very idea that you should alter, so to speak, uh, the, the conceptual uh, framework according to the evolution of uh, physics was completely averse to Kant. According to Kant, you had a priori uh, forms and these a priori forms were valid for all time. No, okay, this, this is, the, I would say, the, um, the popular view of Kant. But in fact, when you read Kant carefully, you, you realize that Kant's epistemology was not a dogma, but what, we, what can be called a research program, a philosophical research program as uh, compared to a, to a scientific research program. Uh, for instance, the Neo-Kantian school of the late 19th century uh, Germany, uh, you know, the, the Neo-Kantian school ruled by Hermann Cohen, uh, Paul Natop, and then Ernst Cassirer, insisted that in fact you can completely uh, take over the whole of uh, Kant's philosophy and turn it into a new research program with the possibility that the precondition for knowledge, that the forms of thought that is used to, to shape out knowledge, can evolve according to the evolution of physics itself. Um, first point, so we see here that we can uh, take you know, we can draw uh, Kant towards Bohr, but we can also draw Bohr towards Kant. How? Because according to Bohr, um, you know, the classical, uh, the classical concepts that are themselves, you know, the concepts on which Kant based his whole critique of pure reason, are something that cannot be completely skipped. We have to keep them in order to, uh, to uh, get 
microphysical knowledge beyond classical, uh, the, the domain of validity of classical physics. So we, we have a domain of validity of classical physics here. We have a domain beyond this, dom this uh, domain, a broader domain, which is ruled by quantum physics. But we still need to accept this validity of classical concepts inside a certain domain to be able to go further towards uh, micro objects ruled by quantum uh, rules and quantum theories. So the classical ordering of experience around us on, at the mac macroscopical level is a condition of possibility of quantum knowledge, according to Bohr. And therefore, I could call that an anthropological condition of possibility of, macroscopic, of macrophysical knowledge. And this was uh, formulated beautifully by Heisenberg, who understood well some parts of uh, Niels Bohr's thinking. He said that what Kant had not foreseen was that these a priori concepts can be the conditions for science and at the same time have a limited range of applicability. So this is a, a revolution in philosophy just as much as it is a revolution of science because that means that you have only a limited range of validity of these a priori rules of Kant, and yet this limited range of validity of the a priori rules of Kant are conditions of possibility of any knowledge that would go beyond this domain of validity. So this is an interesting um, ordering. Now, the second, another very important point of convergence between uh, uh, the philosophy of knowledge of Kant and the philosophy of physics of Niels Bohr is the relational status of attributes. Um, Kant thought that there was no such thing in the whole knowledge, especially physical knowledge, as intrinsic attributes. He insisted that whatever characteristics we are acquainted with in matter are nothing but relations, okay? This is a philosophy, I think it's a way, it's a nice way to understand, uh, you know, in a snapshot, the philosophy of Kant. Kant's philosophy is a philosophy of relations as opposed to a philosophy of intrinsic properties or intrinsic <laughs> attributes or even intrinsic objects. And, uh, you know, the famous concept of thing in itself namely, the, uh, which is typical of Kant also, the concept of the thing uh, that, that uh, it can be described as it is in itself independently on us, of us, sorry, well, in fact, should be understood as a word for the impossibility to, su to subtract the contribution of the knower from what is known. Namely, it is impossible to say that what we call properties can be completely made independent on the way uh, we are exploring them. It, this this uh, disentangling between uh, us as knowing subjects and you know, uh, the, the object itself, in itself, is impossible. This is one crux, I think, of Kant's philosophy. But uh, according to Bohr, things are exactly are quite similar because, as he said in 1929, for instance, the properties of atoms are always obtained by observing their reactions under collisions or under the influence of radiation. Therefore, you cannot speak of attributes of objects independently on the possibility we have to explore them by way of interacting with them. This gave rise to the idea, to the picture of disturbance. People say, okay, there are phenomena out there, and unfortunately, in order to know them, we have to disturb them. But this was not uh, the way um, uh, Niels Bohr saw this, uh, this situation of knowledge. According to him, we should not say that there are phenomena out there that are unfortunately disturbed. In fact, phenomena are, in, are completely um, you know, defined by their uh, uh, being, uh, you know, their emerging out of a certain relations between our 
instruments of knowledge and the micro environment we are trying to explore. Um, so interaction, he says, uh, forms an inseparable part of the phenomena. You cannot disentangle. It's a whole. It's called the wholeness of the phenomenon. Now, we, another point, um, complementarity can be seen as a completely new concept and certainly a, a very un-Kantian concept. But yet, even this concept of complementarity can easily be understood and was understood, in fact, by Niels Bohr himself as a stretching of Kant's requirements for knowledge. Uh, now, first of all, let's understand what is the connection between the thesis of the relationality of attributes and the concept of complementarity. Uh, and Niels Bohr explained that in classical physics, where the influence of measurement can be subtracted, data supplement each other and can be combined in a consistent picture of the behavior of the object under consideration. But in quantum physics, it's not the same because, in fact, um, you know, evidence obtained under different experimental conditions cannot be comprehended be within a single picture, but must be regarded as complementary. Why? Because they, they, you know, each, each um, uh, mode of access cannot be disentangled uh, from the phenomenon it is giving rise to. Uh, there, there has been many uh, claims that, in fact, this, uh, this idea of complementarity uh, was uh, wrong. For instance, uh, uh, the famous Afshar experiment, but that was very uh, quickly dismissed by, f by uh, other experiments and arguments. And there have been many um, experiments that can be called a quantitative which way, uh, analysis, because you know that uh, in, in the usual uh, pattern of complementarity, you can either have the, the information of, on the which way uh, a certain particle has gone, or you have the interference, uh, the wave-like interference, but you cannot have both things at the same time. But here you you can also modulate this, you certainly know that much more than I do, you can modulate that quantitatively and, um, and have, uh, you know, uh, an, a balance between a little bit of which way information and a little bit of uh, interference uh, phenomena. Okay, the complementarities are of three types. The three types of complementarity are, one, um, the complementarity between conjugate variables, which depend on incompatible uh, uh, experimental devices, the complementarity between causation and special lo temporal location of phenomena. You cannot have both at the same time. You cannot, you cannot apply both the causal scheme and have a perfect special temporal coordination. Also, co the well-known complementarity between the wave and particle pictures not between wave and particle nature of things here again, but wave and particle pictures that are used by us in order to make sense of the micro environment. Now, there are two problems with these ideas of complementarity. First of all, when we say that, um, uh, you know, the two conjugate variables that are assessed by two incompatible uh, types of apparatuses, we say that they are mutually exclusive. But why should we say, at the same time, that they are jointly indispensable, as the normal concept of complementarity uh, requires? Um, why should we say that? At any rate, it's usually what Niels Bohr said. He said, evidence obtained under different experimental conditions must be regarded as complementary in the sense that only the totality of the phenomena exhausts the possibility information, uh, exhausts, sorry, sorry, the possible information about the object. So that means that there is behind phenomena a certain object that makes a sort of unity, a hidden unity between the two types of conjugate variables such as the position and the momentum. So there is aboutness. All these predicates are about something which is beneath that. 
So, my question is, is it still possible to refer to some micro-object in itself, independently of, uh, of any mode of access to it, even though there is no such thing, according to Bohr and according to Kant, as, as a micro-attribute in itself, it looks like there is still something like a hidden uh, micro-object in itself that is making a sort of principle of unity of all these uh, conjugate variables. Or should we rather look for a new mode of objectification that is completely uh, averse to the old picture of a certain particle holding the two types of attribute of position and momentum and uh, invent a new set of concepts. The two attitudes were uh, advocated by two very important uh, creators of quantum mechanics. The first um, uh, position was held by Niels Bohr, who had accepted that we still had to use the old visualable, visualizable concepts. We still have to use them because they are the only one we have, the only one we can use. And whereas Schrödinger insisted that we have to do the other strategy, namely inventing new concepts that are completely different from the usual uh, uh, classical concepts in order to order the quantum phenomena. So th these are two attitudes and um, I think we, st we are still, I, I, I think, in between the two. Some elements of the common discourse of physicists looks like we are still referring to particles that hold several attributes, and some other elements of the discourse of uh, physicists, especially in quantum field theory, are quite uh, far from, from this uh, usual picture. And they are closer, certainly, to Schrodinger's reading of, uh, of quantum physics. Now, um, another problem of complementarity is, as I told you, that one version of complementarity insists that there is, you know, incompatibility between space-time location and causation. Whereas in Kant's theory of knowledge, the two things are going uh, together. How can we compensate for this dismantling of Kant's connection between the category of causality and special temporally shaped sensory experience? How is it possible? And uh, Bohr invented a new way. He invented a new way which had to do precisely with complementarity. Quantum physics, he said, forces us to replace the ideal of causality, replace the ideal of causality by a more general viewpoint called complementarity. So complementarity was at the same time a dismantling of the uh, normal pattern of articulation between causality and space-time location, and at the same time it was a replacement for causality, according to Bohr. Complementarity, he added, is called for to provide a frame wide enough to embrace the account of fundamental regularities of nature which cannot be comprehended be within a single picture. So we don't have a single picture of what is going on in nature, but we have a scheme, a scheme of complementarity. So it's replacing the usual pattern of ordering uh, special temporal uh, phenomena according to a, a, a rule of causality. Now, I'm, as I told you, I will broaden a little bit my debate and compare two types of um, philosophies of knowledge, and especially two types of readings of the measurement problem of quantum me mechanics, one which is called naturalized and the other one which is called transcendental. Actually, here again, I will explain, of course, what is transcendental and what is naturalized. Okay, what is transcendental? Uh, first of all, we have to be very careful not to mix up as many, especially many uh, Eng English-speaking philosophers do. We don't have to, to mix up the word transcendental with the word transcendent. The two words have a, a certain comp component of meaning which is common to both, uh, which is ex to exceed experience. But there are two opposite ways to exceed experience. One way to exceed experience is to exceed uh, experience from beneath, 
And the other way of exceeding experience is to exceed experience for, for uh, or to, towards something which is beyond us. So, um, so the transcendental condition is something, not something actually, it's a structure which uh, conditions our experience without being part of experience. Whereas a transcendent uh, thing is something which is beyond experience. So you see the difference. Here I have a structure which is behind me and that preconditions experience. And uh, in the other case, I'm trying to uh, go through the screen of appearances towards something which I cannot be seen. Okay. So, according to Kant, the knower is precisely a transcendental uh, structure. The knower is not known in the act of knowing. Why? Not because it's so mysterious, but just because it is knowing, precisely for the precise reason that it is now knowing. And, um, and uh, Professor Helbron uh, wonderfully explained us this issue of, um, uh, of um, uh, a certain infinite series of objects and subjects uh, in the philosophy of Kierkegaard and uh, Paul Martin Muller. And this is exactly the, the same, of course. Actually, the inspiration was from Kant. Because, okay, if you want to uh, know an object, you have to be a knowing subject. But if you now know, want to know the knowing subject, what do you have to be? Another knowing subject that knows the knowing subject and so on and so on. But there is always something that is escaping the escaping knowledge, not because of something so mysterious, but just because of the very act of knowledge. Um, so in, in the same case, in Bohr's philosophy of physics, the instrumental precondition of a quantum description cannot be described quantum mechanically. It is to be described somehow, and so, quantum, uh, so uh, Bohr describes it classically rather than quantum mechanically. So there is a kind, as I told you, a kind of extraterritoriality of measuring device in Bohr's thought. Uh, the idea that, uh, according to him, the instrument is part of the knower, but not of the known. The reason for that, as I explained to you, is not that there is a special nature of measuring instruments, but just that instru measuring instruments have a certain function in our knowledge that has to be fulfilled somehow. This, condition, this function is that of a condition of possibility of intersubjective agreement about experimental results. We have to be definite about the results when we state them after having obtained them in the laboratory. And uh, a very precise sign in, in Bohr's uh, thought that indeed he was not trying to say that uh, ap measuring apparatuses have a special nature that makes them liable only to classical description, is that according to him, the boundary between what, is, what can be described by quantum physics and what is to be described in classical terms is shifting. Okay, so this means that there is no absolute boundary, it's just a practical boundary which is uh, meant to help us uh, in our theoretization. Now, there is a big advantage of this transcendental status of measurement device. The advantage is that it dissolves the measurement problem from the outset, and this is probably why uh, Nitzbo never saw uh, that there was a problem in the measurement problem. Other people saw that even in his laboratory, but he thought that it was a wrong problem that was dissolved, in fact, from the outset. And I think that from, from his own point of view, this was perfectly right. Because if you accept a classic-like, actualistic description of measuring instrument, if you take that as a presupposition of quantum account of phenomena, there is no need for a mechanism of transition between potentialities and actuality. It's already done from the outset. 
from your very presuppositions. Similarly, since the quantum description is prevented from extending to the totality of the measurement chain, including the pointers, then there is no such thing as the superposition of point and mi microstates. So the, the uh, measurement problem doesn't even have to arise. It's not, it's not solved, of course, but it doesn't have to arise. Now, of course, you know that this strategy has been criticized a lot, and especially by John Bell in a paper, celebrated paper, against measurement. Um, and uh, Bell insisted that we should not stick to propositions that are valid only for all practical purposes. For instance, the classicity of instruments is only valid for uh, all practical purposes, and this could be very well accepted by a Borean thinker of quantum mechanics. And so you don't have to accept either, in that case, uh, what, what uh, Bell called Bohr's shifty split, this famous uh, you know, sh uh, sh uh, split between the classical part and the quantum part of the, of the measurement chain that could be shifted freely according to practical needs. And so what uh, Bell advocated was the project of a naturalized theory of knowledge, namely try to make even the instrument of knowledge an object of uh, physics, an object of our uh, best theories. Uh, for instance, Bohm said that very clearly. He said the measurement process should be understood as a special case of the general laws applying to the entire universe. <coughs> but Bohr didn't say that it, this could not be done. He just said that even the, if this be done, the function of the apparatus has to be uh, fulfilled somehow. And Perez, especially Asher Perez, uh, made a wonderful uh, Bohr-like a reply to Bell's and Bohm's uh, urge towards a naturalized uh, theory of knowledge, namely a theory of knowledge that yes. makes the very apparatus of knowledge part of the nature studied by physics. So the counter objection of uh, Perez and Zurek was that quantum theory can indeed describe, describe anything, absolutely anything, including every piece of the instrument, of the in measuring instrument you, wa you want, but it cannot describe everything because it has to stick to a certain presupposition at a certain point. You have to keep a certain presupposition to speak of what you have observed, to speak of what you are theorizing, formalizing, and so on and so on. The, you need a meta-theory when you have a theory. And the idea that you can naturalize everything is tantamount to say, for instance, in the case of Gödel's theorem, that you, can, you, you, you want to ask arithmetic to, to give a proof of its own consistency. It's quite similar. And uh, many uh, similarities have been drawn between the problem of measurement and, um, and the Gödel theorem. Now, so I conclude, I conclude that, uh, okay, Bohr, Bohr was not explicitly Kantian, this is absolutely obvious, but yet there are, as you saw, there are several features of uh, Bohr's philosophy of physics that are very isomorphic to Kant's uh, philosophy of knowledge. And uh, we can uh, say at this point, because of this impossibility uh, advocated especially by Perez and Zurek of extending uh, quantum theory to everything rather than anything, that Bohr's Kant-like interpretation of quantum theory is not too much outmoded. Instead, I think, because of its extreme generality, because of its, you know, its connection with certain patterns, fundamental patterns of the general theory of knowledge, it might well represent what I call a general framework for any future philosophy of physics. Um, and uh, the acronym is FAFP. <laughs>
And this is quite similar. This acronym was uh, chosen for its similarity with Immanuel Kant's prolegomena to any future metaphysics. But here it's prolegomena to any future philosophy of physics. Thank you very much for your attention.